And your first Mara surprise, everybody, is quite possibly the largest and most magnificent male lion that I have ever seen. Well, to be honest, he is at about 300 meters, so he might be not the most magnificent, but at this distance, with the vista all around, the incredible plains of Africa behind him, the light coming through the clouds, a little herd of buffalo, a whole lot of wildebeest. He is the most magnificent male lion I've ever seen. He's got a great big dark black mane. There's the light falling through the clouds onto the plains beyond north of the Mara River. You are on a live safari in case you're wondering what on earth this fellow waffling at you is. And that lion's now genre, sorry, come back to him. He's being chased by the, by the buffalo. They're not happy to see him. You're on a live safari, everybody. Please talk to us. Hashtag safari live questions at wildearth.tv. We're in Kenya, down in South Africa. Jamie Patterson, the infinite, the elegant antelope, will be telling you about the wonders of the Kruger National Park. Likewise, Taylor. She's our newest addition, our proudest addition to Safari Live. She's going to be also exploring Juma Cheetah Plains in Arethusa this afternoon. There with Eggsy and David, respectively. I'm with jean -Dre on camera. He is not going to put his grubby thumb into the front of the lens because he is now filming the biggest male lion in all of Africa being chased by a whole lot of buffalo. jean -Dre, the buffalo chasing. There we are. You see, look, they're moving on now. This is absolutely fantastic, everyone. Gorgeous, gorgeous sighting. And if you, there is a little bit of jerking, it's just because we're breathing. That lion's quite far away, and we're going to move very shortly to see if we can't get a better view of him, because I think he's getting close to the road. In fact, I think we should do that right now. Jandri, hold on. Batten down the hatches, everybody. Here we go. Yeah. You may hear a collective sitting down and sighing. It's not just Jandre in the vehicle, everyone. Mrs. Wallington and Mr. Wallington are also in the car. Uh, they are doing various things, mostly debating furiously as about where we should be going and what we should be doing. Hello, Jandre. Thank you very much. You can see this car set up slightly differently from Wendy and Jigger and Rusty. It's a very large Land Rover. I didn't think I'd ever miss Wendy, Jigger and Rusty, but I can tell you categorically that I do. Now, the idea, we're sitting here in the Mara Triangle trying to, uh, well, we're telling the story of the migration. There was a large crossing of wildebeest earlier. That first big herd that you saw, um, it sort of streaming across the plains there, they crossed from the north earlier today. And unfortunately, we weren't around when that happened, but that's just how it goes out here. I'm sure a number of them were eaten by the crocodile but now into the Mara Triangle and that's because we've had so much rain here over the last little while. Last night, an unspeakably magnificent evening. We watched the Quechua Tembo Pride of four lionesses and two young male lions killing a young baby zebra in the light of the infrared. It was a fantastic experience and we're hopefully going to go and do the same thing again now. Our tracker in chief, Peter Brat, accompanied by Robert, he is now sitting with that pride. At the moment they're sitting very comfortably under a tree waiting for the evening to come. Look at this magnificent fellow coming towards us. <laughs> Isn't that awesome everyone? That's gone. Everybody this is an extremely famous lion. Well spotted Jandre. His name is Scarface. And he was usurped, apparently, by the three males we've been watching recently. He's a massive fellow. He's lost his right eye. See that? Oh, my goodness. I can't believe we're seeing him. He's one of the most famous lions in all of North of Eastern Africa. He's an old fellow. He's probably well over 10 years old. Oh, goodness, this is amazing. Look at the buffalo coming up behind. They're telling him exactly what they think of him. And it's not what we think of him. We think he's magnificent, don't we? So, Andre, that's a magnificent identification of the lion. Well done. It'll also be the last compliment you get from me today. Um, also, you can see perhaps on his teeth, he's, he's got a completely black mane. Um, he's got, he's missing an eye, obviously, so he looks like a pirate. He's got bluntish teeth. He's got a totally black nose. He's an old fellow. He's not young. Gosh, this is, I, ca I cannot believe this luck.
I'd love to know if anybody's ever heard of this lion, everyone. I'd love to know if any of you have wanted to see him or perhaps been following him. I think he has his own Facebook page, such as his eminence. Look at the size of his mane, everyone. He is at least 20% bigger and heavier than any of those Birmingham fellows, just on account of his age. And the fact that he's managed to survive this long in this environment, it is truly spectacular. Look at those buffalo coming towards him. He has really got some salon quality hair there. Well, actually, it's a bit, it's a bit like yours, Jean-André, but darker than yours. But a very, very similar sort of um, style. He actually looks like the lead singer of an 80s sort of hard rock band. He looks like John Bon Jovi, circa 1983 or so. Gosh, look at that. He's got a full pom-pom as well. Magnificent pom-pom. Hello, hello, lover music. You're a new viewer. It's wonderful to have you along, and what a great time for you to have joined us. While this is your first safari with us, and it's a great joy to have you, this is our first sighting of Scarface, the male lion of the Mara Triangle. <laughs> These buffalo, they are not happy. I'm just going to stand up, everybody. He's going to wobble slightly. You can see they're following him. They are not in the least bit impressed to see him. And behind us, you might be able to hear the alarm calls of the topi and some impala that are watching him come towards us. This is just so wonderful. I'm just getting some photography lessons from Graham Wallington via sign language. Oh, I see. Graham's saying he's limping. He is limping. Oh, here we go. He's an incredible animal. He's coming straight towards us. He likes the smell of Jean-Dre's aftershave. Or maybe Mrs. Wallington. Who knows? But he's tired and he's old and I think he's probably about, mm, I think he's probably about 12, you know. That's an old male lion. Not a big herd of buffalo, but they are not tolerating him. And on his own like this, with the whole herd turned to face him, he doesn't really pose much of a danger to them at all. Except, I suspect, were he to truly push through on an attack, I suspect the rest of them would scarper and he'd be able to take a small one. There's a little calf just in the background there. Right, I'm just going to move the vehicle slightly. Sorry, John Drake, there's a, another car coming and we have to just get out the way. Right, let's move. John Drake, are you all right there? Hello James, you're wondering why Scarface has such a dark mane compared with, um, with the Birminghams. Well, Scarface has such a dark mane because he's older than them. James, there's no other reason for it other than that. Is that okay, Jean -Ray? Um He's older than them. His testosterone levels are very high. That's how he's managed to maintain such an amazing sort of status as this great lion of the Mara Triangle. And there, the buffalo now turning away. They no longer feel that he's a terrifying threat. See, I'm aware those seven cubs that have recently been killed by the three usurpers, the Marsh Male Coalition, I think that he probably was the father of those three. And anybody who would like to tell us a bit more about Scarface, I know many of you watch the great celebrity wildlife icons of Africa on Facebook and on various social media platforms. Please feel free to tell us about him. I'd love to know a bit more about him.
Hello, Maria. You're wondering if those, um, if the Marshmallow Coalition we've been watching are perhaps the offspring of the Notch Boys, the famous Notch Boys. Maybe they're from, um, I'm assuming you watched them during the Big Cat Diaries. Uh, uh, they could well be. I think it's more than likely, yes. Do I think that they, uh, that we'll see the Notch Boys? I think it's highly unlikely. And that's because, Maria, they're the other side of the river. So we're in the Mara. The Mara, of course, is split in two by the Mara River, and we're on the eastern side of the bank, us western side, and the Notch Boys and the rest of the Marsh Pride live on the eastern side of the Mara River, and it's a very convenient kind of um, territorial marker. And these lions don't often cross. This fellow must have crossed fairly recently, though, I think. Gosh, that was spectacular, wasn't it? To see a lion walking through this grass, you can see how perfectly coloured he is, why he's this colour. i got to tell you, when we came out today, I was terribly nervous. I thought we had such a good time we had last night. I don't know how, you know, how could we possibly top it? Well, this place just can't stop delivering. It really is spectacular. Now, jean while he's lying there doing not much at all, what I'm going to ask you to do is just... Go off to where the light is um, touching the far plains there across the river and just show, I think it's a herd of wildebeest there. And they may or may not come down towards the river sometime during the afternoon. So what our plan is to do basically is going to be to check these crossings once more and then we're going to slowly make our way back towards the Kitschwetembo Pride and see what they do during the course of the evening. There's some wildebeest, I think, to the right of... Oh, no, there you are. You're on the right place. Are there wildebeest there? Have I gone mad? I think I've gone mad. While I take my madness medication, everybody, let's head across to Jamie Patterson, the elegant antelope, and find out about the elephants that she has to show you. There's Topi, everybody, are looking at a totally different line. We've just come up to the river here to see if there's something going on. And there is. It's not a crossing, but there's a lioness in that thicket there. She's just flushed those wildebeest and Topi, who I think were maybe thinking about going back across the river. This is a traditional crossing point. Let's see what unfolds here. It's almost impossible to tell what's going on, of course, because there's so much going on all over the place. Look at the white beards of those gnus. Look, there, the Topia are running now. Now, the lions here do a lot of sort of sprinting. They don't, they're not the sort of pro ambush predators in the same way that they are in the Sabi sand, mainly because there's not much to hide behind. John Ray, do you see the very large tree? Go to the base of that. There's the lioness. She's just underneath there. There's our second lion. You've never seen that lion before. And nor have we. This is our first sighting of that lioness. Don't know how many there are in there. Can only see the one so far. There's just action all over this place. It is quite astounding. Hello, Joey in Australia. You want to know what a topi alarm call sounds like? It sounds like this. There, that last one was a good one. <sniffs> practice it at home, Joey. Chandra, would you like to practice it? No, that's pathetic. Um, and we're just getting Mr. Wallington to keep an eye on Scarface. He's just behind us. Grief, we really don't know where to look here. I don't think she's going to do too much. Let's sit with her for five minutes. Then we're going to go back to Scarface, and then we're going to head for the other pride and see what they're doing. They are, at the moment, tracker in chief Peter Brat says they are sleeping. Look, the topi behaving exactly like a buffalo would or an impala in the Selby Sand. You've seen them many times doing that, approaching the predator as if to say, I can see you. Now, that distance, a topi is an extremely fast antelope, one of the fastest. 
and so the lion wouldn't have much chance. Ah, now I was waiting for this question. I'm very pleased it has come. Hello, James Richard. You say, what is the social structure or herd structure of the topi like? Apparently the most variable of any antelope at all. How do I know that? Well, I read it yesterday morning because I was quite confused about it myself. In this particular area, it would seem that, well, it is pretty variable. There are areas where it's pretty standard issue harem structure of a male and a couple of females and sometimes they move in agglomerations of up to 2,000 at a time where it's very unclear who's dominant over who. Sometimes they live completely singly, sometimes in a few, in a little group of, of females, but it's the most variable herd structure of any antelope species there is, and I think it probably depends quite largely on exactly sort of what is, um, you know, how much there is to eat as to what their herd structure actually is. Isn't that fantastic? Look at her glorious colours there. Now, this is a totally different lioness. She could come from, um, what have we heard? It's called the Paradise Place Pride, I think. Was that right, Graham? It was the Paradise... It's Paradise Something Pride. I think that's who she's part of. Here come the topi. Look at this wonderful running we're watching here, everyone. Look at them go. Oh, that's beautiful. Isn't that gorgeous? I'm going to have to stand up, Jondry. There, they made an alarm call. They went... <sniffs> Hi, everyone. I'm just checking on Scarface back there. The buffalo don't seem to have eaten him, but they are moving towards him. Difficult to know what to do. I think we're going to go back to Scarface. I'm going to snap off one horrendous picture. Very nice. There we go. Okay, let's go back to Scarface, because I don't think this lioness is going to try and catch one of these things right now. We'll just have a quick last look at them moving there. All right, let's go. Now she's going down in towards the river. I think it's going to be worth our while going back to that male because I'm not sure we'll see him again. All right, while we get into position, you haven't seen Taylor yet this afternoon. That is a dreadful pity. Let's remedy that immediately. Go and say hello to Taylor and we'll see you with that big lion. but I suppose that's what it's going to do. Now this, of course, one of the great migration stories. The crocodiles, the great dinosaurs of the deep, as I have started to sort of clichédedly call them, and they like to wait here, sometimes for up to a year, for the wildebeest to return, and then eventually they know they're going to get an incredible meal. There's another huge croc behind that one. And he has got in his mouth what seems to be half a wildebeest. <laughs> it really is quite astounding, this place. We've left Scarface. He's uh, fast asleep in the sun, as a man of his standing and stature should be, of course, relaxing in a glorious day like this, perhaps just before some rain. Isn't this wonderful? The there's the other croc coming out the water now, Jondry. He's, going, he's with the sacred ibis. There, he's picking up his stuff. That's the stomach contents of the probably the same wildebeest. There's a lot of really, really half-digested grass in that, I suppose. Not very delicious. And there he goes. So you'll be wanting that to rot under the water, except that it's soft tissue. So maybe he just wants to kind of empty it out. None, none of the predators like to eat the stomach contents. They love the stomach, but not the stomach contents so much. He was in that I, poor little ibis. Oh, look at him eating there. Ugh. Everyone, that will smell and taste something vile. <laughs> oh, man. I've got to tell you, when we came out this afternoon, I thought, no way is we going to top yesterday. 
I don't know if we have none, but we've certainly been fascinated by a whole plethora of new things to see. Scarface, this giant crocodile, sacred ibis eating carrion. Isn't that amazing? Oh, and Jandri. <laughs> I don't know if you've seen it. There's a small crocodile, a much smaller one, just behind the behemoth. Just right behind him. So in front, of, closer to us than to him. Here you are, down below. Oh. Over many years, everybody, I've been telling people that crocodiles of two different sizes don't live together. This is patently untrue. There are a number of different sized crocodiles here. So wherever I read that was absolute nonsense. Astounding sighting here of the biggest crocodile there with a piece of wildebeest in his mouth. Isn't this amazing? And then two or three almost as big ones trying to kind of get a piece of it. And they've been fighting and he's been kind of tossing it up and down. Now what's interesting here is that he cannot swallow it. It's too big for him to swallow. It's too, um, too whole. That wildebeest probably died today. You can see it's still red. It probably died during the crossing that happened probably about two hours, two or three hours ago. And normally, of course, what crocodiles have to do is let their, um, let their carcasses rot in the water first. He's a bit reticent to do that because little bits of it will be taken by the smaller crocs here. And there's a very brave Hammerkop walking around as well there. Look at him there. Yeah, Bethany, you say would any of these crocodiles eat the shorebirds? Um, I don't, I don't think so, no. I mean, maybe if they really want, were really hungry. Look at this. Look at this. But no, I mean, we know that um, a cattle egret are actually able to pick bits and pieces out of crocodiles' mouths while they lie there with their mouths open in the sun trying to lose heat. And for some reason, they don't bite them. They don't try and eat them. Maybe it is the sensation of feathers on the tongue that they don't like. That one behind there has got his own piece, and the one in front is not letting go. I'm going to give you an idea of how big these things are. Those things there are probably about, I'm going to say, four and a half meters. That's if you multiply it by three, is roughly 13 and a half feet. So almost 15 feet, those enormous crocodiles. Look how fat the one on the right is. He's so fat he can hardly open his eyes. And a crocodile that size, as I told you yesterday, can go two years without a meal. Just amazing stuff. We've also seen a sacred ibis. I'm not sure if the sacred ibis it is. It's still around there. It was also eating a bit of wildebeest. So they're not known for their vulturine characteristics, but that sacred ibis there had had, has had a lovely meal of freshly drowned wildebeest. Then off to the other side, oh, let's just watch and see what happens here. There might be a bit of intestine that that one's eating. No, it's a bit of skin, I think. No, that looks like innards. Even that is too much for the crocodile to swallow. They cannot break it up cannot chew, so they have to have pretty, um, pretty rotten stuff. Look at that. The very big one on the right is now starting to cause trouble. Those are massive, massive dinosaurs we're looking at. They could be more than a hundred years old, everyone. We know that we think the oldest living vertebrate around is probably the green shark, and I think they found one the other day of about 400 years old. I think it was 400. Look at these guys. You wouldn't want to get chomped by that, everyone. It would be very unpleasant indeed. <laughs> this is just incredible. Just crawling over his mate. That thing is more than a ton. Oh, Debbie, you say, would these crocs dare to attack a lion like Scarface if he tried to cross the river? Yes, for certain. They're much bigger than him. Much bigger. Scarface would have to be very careful. That smaller one there, look at this. 
And this is one of the great stories of the migration. These wildebeest, they don't know how many are going to get across and how many aren't. This is why it's so difficult to predict whether they're going to cross or not. Because so many of them do get taken. Look at that. There's nothing the other one can do except just tolerate that because if he opens his mouth, the whole thing will fall out. That's the wildebeest head and four quarters. That is pretty disgusting, everyone. If you are a sensitive viewer, I'm sorry about this. You'll have to close your eyes, but it really is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. And if you're a younger viewer, just remember, this is how wildlife often acts, and that's okay. This is how these animals have evolved to live, and they have to make a living somehow. And I know that if you are a younger viewer thinking, ugh, crocodile, um, well, I, I sympathize with you, I must say. I often find it quite difficult to feel sympathy for crocodiles myself, but they have a right to life just like the rest of us. There are one or two wildebeest, well, well I'm, not, I'm going to tell you, I'm not going to ask Jean to move the, the camera. There are a few wildebeest off to the left hand side thinking about crossing the river, but then very few of them. I don't think we're going to worry about those, let's just watch these crocs. Oh, the big fella is going to go and take that one now. But the little one, you see, much faster. If you weigh more than a ton of reptile flesh, you ain't so f quick. Except in the water, of course, and when you're making a strike. Look at that. Let me take one or two more pictures, everyone. Then we're going to have to go off to the lions. Because we want to be there when they get active. Dina, you want to know if crocodiles kill by drowning their prey or by breaking their necks? Dina, um, it's a bit of both. They can break the smaller ones' necks and spines and legs, but basically they grab whatever they can and then drag the prey under the water. So it is probably largely drowning that occurs. All right, everyone, we're going to have to move on from here. So let's move on from here. We're going to head across to Taylor and the Sabi Sands elephants, those wonderfully confiding pachyderms, and we'll see you next, probably, with the Kichotembo Pride. Well, we've, we're just sort of on our way to the lions, everybody, and then we stopped here, and these wildebeest looked like they were going to cross, and now they don't. But look how many there are. It's still a wonderful sight, even if they aren't going to come leaping down to the water's edge. And the, one of the reasons they aren't going to come leaping down to the water's edge will show you just now. But let's just watch that amazing herd walking off. They're moving. You know, they come, they go running into the bush, and they sometimes turn around and come herring back again. So let's sit here for a little while and see. I think it'll be worth us just waiting here for a little while to see what's going to happen. They've stopped at the top. I can see two of them, two or three of them stopped. Sometimes they turn around and come back. Yeah, one or two of them have turned. They're very unpredictable fellows, these. Uh, one more coming down. And that's one of the reasons they're very reticent to come. That's a particularly stupid crocodile. He can't understand why his meal isn't walking straight into his jaws. He has not realised that he needs to hide underneath the water if he wants the wildebeest to cross. Jandre off to the left, and, and he especially doesn't want to open his mouth like that, because that's just saying, that's just really telling them a story they don't want to know. What's on the left, James? Just on the left there, in that gap in the bushes there, you can see them turning around and coming back this way. They're coming sort of streaming back now. There we are. So we might be lucky. Oh, here we go. Now Graham Wallington and Peter Bratt in their imminent statistical wisdom have come up with a term called the mean wildebeest which to those of you who are not statistically minded means the sort of average movement of the wildebeest and in this case the mean wildebeest is now moving back towards the water you see they're deeply indecisive creatures, this is one no one knows if and when they're ever going to cross having a bit of a giggle because I've just turned to the left where there is an enormous truck parked and out of it is probably about seven million dollars worth of um, lens equipment pointing 
at these wildebeest, hoping desperately that they're going to cross. They make this lens I'm carrying here look like a small pea shooter. Isn't this beautiful? Even if they don't cross, what a story. This is what happens day in and day out out here. These wildebeest think about crossing, then they think about not crossing, then they think about crossing again, and then they think about not crossing again. All the while, the gormous crocodile sits there with his mouth open as if to say, Come, why aren't you climbing into my mouth? I'm hungry. And the three-banded plover walks past the front of him thinking, What an absolute twit. That isn't a um, three-banded plover at all. It might be a bird we haven't seen before. Let me address it with my binoculars. The skies are turning grey, everyone, which bodes well for lion hunting. It doesn't bode well for Chandre's um, pneumonia. But you know, Chandra's a tough fellow. I think that's a sandpipe, everyone, not a three-band plover that was there. There, they're moving off to the left now, Chandra, way off to the left there. They're on the run. Oh, wonderful to see them run. Shamsan, you want to know if crocodiles have a family structure? No, not really. Um, the females sometimes live in smallish groups, but no, it's not very kind of definite, and they're quite territorial about their little patch of river, especially if the females have laid eggs there. We're going to give these chaps two more minutes, and if they keep going that direction, there's a bull bull you can see there. That's the bird, everyone. Ah, oh, very nice, Andre. Hmm. They've got two minutes to turn around. Aaron, you want to know what the chance of seeing a glossy ibis in the Mara are? Apparently not too bad. I haven't seen one here yet, but we might be lucky while we're here. One wildebeest here, the mean wildebeest now turning back around. The last wildebeest, that's the, um, that's the outlier wildebeest, that's called Malcolm Gladwell. And the others, through the gap there, thinking about coming back. So, Aaron, I'm just checking the map here. Yes, the glossy ibis does occur here, I am correct, but I haven't seen one since we've been here. We're going to have to make a move towards those lions, I think. Otherwise, we're going to miss them. But let's just spend another two minutes or so here. And while we do that, I just have to ask Jandre to look, show you this unbelievable sight there of a glorious scene and a giraffe tipple kerchi crossing over the plains, and a rainbow, a very faint one. In fact, I'm hallucinating, there isn't one. Shamsan, you want to know if it's good to be in the middle, the back, or the front of a herd of crossing wildebeest? I'd say it's by far best to be in the middle of a herd of crossing wildebeest, otherwise you're likely to get noshed. No one wants to be noshed by a crocodile, Shamsan. Horrid way to go, I'm told. Andre, are you getting a very beautiful shot there? Or are you just getting a back cramp? <laughs> Let me get out of your way. All right, everyone, we're going to leave these chaps, I think. Mm, except. All right, let's go to Jamie. She's got some more elephants. The rain seems to be coming in soon, so let's get to those lions and find out what they're going to be doing. Welcome back to the Mara Triangle, everybody. We're sitting here in the lee of the Ulalolo Escarpment. Three lions of the Kichwatembo pride, one young male and two females over there. And it is just magnificent. Over in the distance, off to the left-hand side, you can see the rain is starting to fall, pouring down in the southern part of the Mara Triangle. Isn't that beautiful? Absolutely stunning. And as Jandre plans along the top of the Ulalolo Escarpment, you'll see the magnificent place that we're staying, Angama Mara, the latest addition to the lodges of this area, and quite possibly the most magnificent lodge I've ever seen on all of this great continent. So it's a great privilege to be staying there. If you're ever thinking about coming here, that's the place to be, Angama Mara. Now, we are 
we've arrived at the lions recently and we're sitting here hoping that they are going to go hunting tonight we think that they are going to be hunting and i'm sorry about the bits of wind that are going on uh, john ray you need to look behind us there's a lioness on the stalk right now so sorry about the wind everybody there is a storm blowing in a gorgeous storm it was a real blessing to have any kind of rain here in the african wilderness i don't know what this lioness is talking i can't see uh, there's a Thompson's gazelle, seemingly unaware, way away, probably about, ooh, I don't know, maybe, maybe 400 meters a mile. The old Thompson's gazelle, can you see it there? So it's way in the distance, just about to cross the road in front of us there. Now you're watching a live broadcast from the Mara Triangle. It's an astounding joy to be here, and the patterns of this place are just so productive, an incredible number of species. You may have just seen the elephants, we've seen the Thompson's gazelle, we've seen lions, we've seen thousands of wildebeest and zebra and topi and Maasai giraffe and warthogs and buffalo and endless other species. It really has been the most fantastic time here. Let's watch this lioness goes on the hunt. I'm going to sneak down into the car. There are more than one Thompson's gazelle there and we're going to see if we can't get a little bit closer. We're going to drive behind her and do our best not to disturb the hunt. And move just behind her. Look at the elephants, isn't that wonderful? Just a little bit difficult for Jean Dri to keep on her while we're moving. And you can ask us questions on the, in the comments section. Hello Francie, you wonder if this lion is bigger and sleeker than the lionesses of the, Sar of the Sabi stand in South Africa where we also broadcast from? Francie, no. The lionesses are not sleeker and larger. They're actually pretty much the same size, I reckon. It's just because they're in the open, I think, that they look perhaps slightly different. This lioness is the perfect colour. Look at her, she's just got down, hunkering down, her shoulders crouched, waiting to spring. Now, she's a long way from them, and in South Africa, I would say that there was no chance she was going to have a run from here. But you know what? The lionesses of this area that we've watched, and we've watched three hunts now, they run. They're sprinters. They're not quite as good at sprinting as cheetah, but they, because of the lack of bushes here, they have to run. Now, she, what she's got between her and those Thompson's gazelles, which are looking this way, by the way, is a little termite mound. And that little termite mound is all that stops them seeing her, but the wind is perfect. The wind is blowing straight towards us, and what that means is that they cannot smell the lion. She's using the wind to her advantage. That clanking was me pulling the roof over the top because it has started to rain now. Hello D. you say you love these drives so much since you found them. Well. I suggest very strongly that you save all your shekels and uh, book a place at Angama Mara. You can come and sit in these plains and watch the unbelievable sightings that we're looking at right now, firsthand. Because I promise you, this is a spiritual experience being in this place. It's an ancient land with just the most amazing sort of, um, oh, I don't know, the most amazing interactions that have been going on here for millennia and millennia. Now, Amy Stewart, you're wondering how many lions there are normally in a pride. Amy, it really does vary quite a lot. But over here, this pride has got four lionesses, two young males, apparently another two lionesses. We've seen one of them. She's actually just killed a zebra, believe it or not. That's been reported to us by one of the Ngama Mara staff. He's just watched her take down a zebra while we were waiting for the wildebeest to cross the, cross the river. Look at that. They're infinitely patient, these cats. I'm just checking behind us to see if the others aren't coming up, but they're not. And lionesses will often kill on their own, you know. And it's been shown, especially in East Africa, where we are obviously now sitting now in Kenya, it's been shown that lionesses hunting on their own often... Excuse the sound, everyone. The microphone is just attaching itself quietly. There we are. There we are. Isn't that beautiful? She's moving now slowly. Look how perfectly coloured she is. She's a perfect colour. And look how carefully she places her feet. 
even though the wind is blowing and those Thompson's gazelles don't have a chance of hearing her. She's still very careful. Watch how carefully she places that foot. I'm getting as low down as possible, infinitely patient. This is amazing. And to watch it at this time of the day. We're going to follow these lines into the night, everybody. And this is live, just in case you were wondering if you happen to be watching some kind of recorded show, you are watching a completely live lion hunt from the Mara Triangle. I'm going to take this opportunity to move very slightly forward. Hello Ramzo, you're in Germany. How very good to hear from you, all the way from Germany. You say it's great to be on safari with us. Well. Ramzo, it's great to have you on safari with us and I hope that you will one day be able to come through here and experience this place for yourself. I have been gobsmacked, alternately um, amazed, awe-inspired and just astounded at the amazing sights, the scenery, the animals, the life, the diversity, the fertility of this landscape is utterly beyond speech. Which is why I've run out of so many superlatives to use. Only so many superlatives one can use, you know. That was me taking a picture, that click, I'm the world's worst wildlife photographer, so it's unlikely you'll see that picture ever. And as I said, we are going to follow these lions into the night. Despite the rain, and despite the wind, we watched them kill last night, you know, it was the most amazing experience. As the darkness fell, they started to move, and they stalked off through the clearings. They were chased by, eventually, 40 hyenas, and eventually they killed a little baby zebra. They devoured it, and then they had a wonderful night off. They came back to the same place where we found them yesterday evening at the same time, and they seem to be about to do it again. There is the beautiful Thompson's gazelle with some, I think, spur-winged lapwings. I'm not very familiar with the birds here, but I think that's what those are. Sorry, Kurt, I missed your question. I'm just going to ask for it again. Here it comes. Now, Kurt, you're wondering if the lions wouldn't get distracted by us. Now, yes, they could be distracted by us in theory, but no, they're not going to be now, and I'll tell you why. I'm sitting next to her. She won't be distracted by us. It's quite possible that if we were to go too much closer, the Thompson's gazelle would move away from us. They won't be as confident around us as she is, but you can see she is totally unaffected by us. Now, as light as darkness falls and the light fades, we're not going to put a white light on them. We're going to put what we call infrared light on, which means they will be unable to see it. We will be able to, with this rather clever camera that Jean Dre is operating, we will be able to um, view them without them kind of being disturbed by the light, and most importantly, without their prey being alerted to their presence. So, no, that is a very good question, Kurt, and it's very important that you understand we're going to do our utmost not to disturb these lions or their prey. We want to be observers not participants in any lion hunt that's going on here. Isn't this special? An amazing standoff going on. Look at the wind blowing, blowing the smell of the Thompson's gazelles onto them. Mark Kim, you're wondering if the... Sorry, one second. Um, you're wondering if lions here have a sort of um, a, a taste for specific kinds of prey. Uh, I think it's largely to do with what they can catch. Some prides do specialize. Apparently this pride here, when the wildebeest are in the area, which they are now, or the 1.4 million of them have come into this area now, and yes, they do have a preference for wildebeest and zebra apparently when they are here, but when they aren't here, what they like to eat apparently is warthog. They eat a lot of warthogs when they're on their own here without the wildebeest and zebra, and also topi. Topi is a sort of a sesame, if you know what that is. It's a most beautiful antelope. It's my new favourite. Well, it's a close favourite. Close to the Nyale, anyway. Now, if you've just joined us, let me just give you an idea of what's going on here. We're sitting in the Mara Triangle. That is in southern Kenya, in East Africa. 
possibly the world's most exciting continent, and we're watching the Kichwa Tembo pride of five lionesses and two young male lions of about two years old each stalking some Thompson's gazelles. The other lions are just behind here watching the progress of the slightly older one, seeing if she's going to be lucky, for they will almost certainly share in the meal if she's successful. She's being completely and absolutely patient. The light is starting to fade and that is going to favour her. She's watching them very carefully. There we go. Now oh, she's starting to move. They've obviously turned away from her. Oh, this is amazing. Hello, Brian. You say you love that this job is now in the Mara. Great job to everyone involved. Well, I love it too. I'm absolutely astounded by the things that I've seen here. And I hope that all of you will be able to experience the Mara one day. Especially from the glorious luxury of Angama Mara, where we happen to be staying. We didn't expect that, and wow, it is quite something. Sitting perched atop the Ulalolo escarpment, you'd actually be able to see this lioness from here with a good pair of binoculars. And what she's doing, every time they turn around, look away, she takes a couple more steps forward. You can see her colour is perfect. This is why a lion is tawny. Look at the colour of her in the grass here. I'm going to move slightly forward. This is mainly because we're about to be overtaken. And just to keep you posted, we have got special permission to be here after dark. So we will be following them after dark. What I do not want to do is frighten those Tommies. Hello, Stan. You say, do I know the name of the pride? Stan, the pride is the Kichwa Tembo pride. Here she goes. Here she goes. She's going to move up to that termite mound there. Look at this. Look, there they're running. They've run away. I don't know what happened there. I think she stood up too soon. You see, she went over the top of the termite mound. Yeah, they're looking straight at her. You might also be able to hear a bird going... And I suspect quite strongly that that's an alarm call. I can actually see the little blighter in front of us. Jandre, on the very longest stalk of grass. No, don't worry, don't worry about it. It's flown away. And I think that is what alerted the Tommies. Then they looked up and they saw the lioness coming over this little termite mound. Well, that was the first hunt. Let's see what happens for the rest of the evening. She's still following. We might turn around and go back to the rest of the pride. But one thing that we are going to have to do is pick, our, pick up our Ascari. He's one of the park staff who's going to accompany us in the night to make sure we don't get lost. Now, Nilesh, you have asked a very pertinent question. I'm going to follow this lioness because the rest of them are behind us, and I think they're going to be, they will follow her eventually. Um, Nilesh, you're wondering why she's hunting alone. Do they always hunt alone, or do you thought they hunted in groups? Nilesh, they do hunt in groups, but sometimes they hunt on their own. Now, we've just watched, or we've just heard from one of the Angama Mara chaps that he's seen a young zebra being killed by a single lioness, and we know that lionesses on their own eat just as well, in fact better, than lion prides with less than three lionesses in them. So two and three lionesses eat more poorly. Here comes the Tommy now to the right hand side. It can see the lion. What they're doing, let me just tell you what they're doing. They're coming up here simply to make sure that she and her kin are without or outside of the flight distance. There they are. So Linesh, they will be, uh, they will hunt on their own sometimes but normally they will wait for the prior. Now, I've never heard a Thompson's Gazelle alarm call. Now, for those of you watching us on Facebook, we are going to be continuing with this broadcast into the night. So join us, perhaps, for the rest of the evening, and we'll see if the Kichwa Tembo Pride doesn't kill as darkness falls. Jandre, can you hear that? The Thompson's gazelles are going, whew, they've got like...
whistle of their alarm call. There. It's not quite a whistle, but it's not quite... You know it's an alarm call, but it's not like an impala's alarm call. Let's move up a little bit here. <laughs> Angie in Ohio, you make an interesting point. You say, it seems that with all the grassland here, rather than the wood of the sabi sand, that they have an easier time here. I'm not sure that they have an easier time here, Angie. I think they have a more difficult time because there's less to hide behind. But at the same time, I also think you're right in some respects because, of course, um, there's more to kill. There's actually so much more here. Now, John Ree, while she looks off towards the western horizon, why don't you show everybody the incredible sunset that she's looking at? Or just stay on her. He's very recalcitrant, this cameraman of mine. I'm going to beat him fairly shortly. There we go. Look at that. <laughs> Hello, Jason in Sri Lanka. You're a new viewer. It's great to have you with us. You want to know why it is that the lions have got a tuft on the back of their tails, and are they the only cats that have that? Jason, they are the only cats that have that. And there's something else about lions that is also completely unique to them which you might want to think about. And that, of course, is that they are social cats. Now, as you watch that cat walking perfectly camouflaged through that bush there, what is the most obvious thing that you can see? There are two things. One, of course, the pom-pom on the end of the tail, and the other, the black bits of the, of the ears. And so what they're doing, or what she's doing there, is giving a signal to the other lionesses when she lifts her tail, and that's what they follow when they're on the hunt together. I think we should move forward and follow her a little bit. Jandri, how's the weather out there? Is it not inclement any longer? Okay, we're going to have to leave her briefly, and so I'm going to ask if Becca can take you back to South Africa, because we need to go and pick up our Ascari, and then we'll be back on the hunt very shortly. So let's head to Jamie. She has got Mr. Wahlbergs, my favorite two birds in all the world. And in the left-hand side of your picture, quite possibly the most gorgeous sunset I've ever... Well, it's pretty up there. It's a pretty gorgeous sunset. Just look at that. Isn't that incredible? And apparently my audio is no good. I don't know why that is the case. Hello, hello. Can you hear me? So, Andre, how's the audio your side? Hey, everybody, this is the technical glitches we have of broadcasting out of the Mara Triangle as the lions go on the hunt. Jandre, how's the audio yeah, your side? Yeah, it's slightly softer than it was. is slightly softer. We're not really sure why at this stage. Isn't this gorgeous? Have you ever seen a scene like that, everyone? The Kitratembo pride hunting across the plains of East Africa with a glorious sun going down in the background. Looks like one of the young males and a lioness. And now they do this sort of play behavior, which is so wonderful to watch, just before they kind of get into the real business of the hunting. Now, what we need to try and do is, A, keep an eye out for holes, because I don't know this area, and I think there are holes about. We also need to try and figure out where the other lioness is. We came back to these lot, to this lot, and they look like they're on the hunt to me. Where the lioness who went off in front is, I'm not sure. But they're all stalking across this grassland now. Hello, James Richard. You're saying how close is the hyena den, which is a very good way for me to just sort of recap what happened last night. Last night we watched these lions hunting. They killed a baby zebra 
and they were followed at the end by at least 40 hyenas, if you can believe it. And James Richard, the hyena den that they stumbled on yesterday evening is quite a long way behind where we are now. And so they're moving away from it. They're moving in exactly the opposite direction to the direction they moved yesterday. I can't believe we've been lucky enough to have them, well, just moving and hopefully hunting very shortly. Now, just to keep you posted, of course, we are going to carry on into the night. We're going to do it with infrared light. So the gorgeous colors you're seeing now will be replaced with black and white. And that's from the infrared lighting that we have. And Taylor and Jamie will obviously get darker much later than we will hear, probably about 45 minutes or so. And so they will be in color while we are in infrared. We're not about to do it just yet, but I will warn you when we go to infrared. It does make the picture not quite as pretty as this, but lions hunt at night, and the best way to follow them at night is with infrared. And off behind, just to the left of your picture, there is a great storm brewing. I'm hoping the wind is blowing it away, because the wind is blowing sort of from the lions towards that great storm. She comes up onto the termite mound just to get a slight look, to get a bit of a vantage point, which will give me an opportunity to see if I can see the other lions. In front, I'm scanning the thickets there. A lot large thicket in front of us. Andre, you got sight of any of the others? Just the two back here. Oh, it's beautiful. The smell, everyone. The smell of the grass and the gentle wind blowing in from the northwest is just too wonderful. It smells like fresh straw with a bit of green mixed in. Ah. Now. Douglas, I'm going to ask you a question once I've told Jandre what this lioness has spotted. There's a very large warthog, Jandre, just off to the right-hand side at about almost 3 o'clock. He's quite a long way away. That's what she's been looking at. And I wonder if that's not where the other lions have gone. Although there's a vehicle up ahead... I can't see the rest of the pride. Can you see the warthog? Yes, there we are. They grow them big here, those pigs. That is a warthog, isn't it? <laughs> Not a buffalo. <laughs> so, sorry, I've completely lost the question that I was supposed to be answering. Can we have it again, please, Becca? Becca is directing from the Sabi sand, everybody. Oh, here's another lioness. Two next to us there. One male. Oh yes, Douglas, you're wondering about why the two young males have not been killed in the takeover of the coalition here. Douglas, it's because they're not cubs and they're not adults yet. They're just kind of members of the pride. They haven't hit puberty, so they're not trying to mate with any of the lionesses. And likewise, they're not small enough to, uh, to prevent their mothers going into estrus. So there's no real reason for the males to kill them. It's not impossible for the males to kill them, but they're pretty much out of the woods when they get to their age. I'm just going to wait for them to settle there, and then I think we'll move forward. They've definitely seen that warthog. He's in a very good position for them, because the wind is blowing from him to the lions. I think the rest of the lions are probably where those ones are looking now. Let's sneak a little bit forward. How marvellous. Hunting with the Kitratembo pride again across the plains of East Africa, just below the Ululolo escarpment. Olulolo, I have to pause every time I say that. Olulolo escarpment. The two vehicles up ahead. And I think what's going on there is that they are with the lions. We keep going. Ease our way across the clearing here. I don't want to miss any action. They're in the thicket there. Hello, Marianne. You're wondering where, when these lions have cubs, they hide them for safety, given that there doesn't seem to be nearly the same number of places for them to hide as they have 
perhaps in a more wooded area. There are actually lots of places, Mary, and there are termite mounds, there are plenty of drainage lines and gullies, small thickets and forests, and that's where they'll hide them. Now, this lioness, it's a, now we're in a kind of catch-22 situation. Do we wait with this one, or do we go to the others, who are clearly in the lead of this hunt? Because this one might be standing here as an ambush. I'm going to make the call to go forward, everyone. We're going to see if we can find the others, just simply because we know where these ones are. We know that they will probably come out of the thickets, at least go towards the thickets, and these ones may well come out. The other fancy toy that we have here that we'll use if it doesn't rain is something called a thermo imaging camera. And what we're able to do with it is shine it into the blackness of the night. And if there is something that has body heat, well, then we will see it shining up as a white light on the screen. Now, these lions are now moving. The ones we were looking at are moving towards us. Just going to see if we can't catch sight of the others in the thicket here. Getting into this thicket in this car is going to present something of a challenge, if not an impossibility. We will do what we can. Something is going on here. Something is afoot. We should pull briefly off the road here. And we'll show you the others coming back towards this way. Jean, or shall I go back a little bit? Sorry. Let me just... Are you right there? There we are. That's just a little bit easier. I'm going to keep a look on the right-hand side. I think they've lost the others, you know. But let's sit here and wait. We've got sight of three. They're looking this way. Let's see what happens. We're going to stay here. We're not going to go back to South Africa just yet. Let's wait and see what the lions of the Kichotembo Pride do. It's a good opportunity for me once again to welcome any new viewers that we might have. You're watching a live safari. This is happening right now in the Mara Triangle of Southern Kenya. Part of the Mara Serengeti ecosystem. Two million hectares of unfettered wildlife access these animals have, or unfettered land access they have, they can move anywhere they like. The lions, of course, absolutely territorial, so they don't go down into the Serengeti of Tanzania, but of course, the wildebeest, the 1.4 million wildebeest, 300,000 Thompson's gazelles, 200,000 Grant zebras, they do, they move to and fro in this endless cycle of migration between here and down in the southern plains of the Serengeti. Also, time to welcome Mr. Nokia to this um, to this show. <laughs> Mr. Nokia giving us a well warm welcome. Um, <laughs> let's see what these lions do. I think they're going to try and link up, perhaps have a bit of play behaviour, and then we'll see if they hunt. Jean-Dre, how's the precipitation up there? Dry. Excellent. I may just pop my head up then and see if I can see what's going on with the other lions. There we are, just settling down, getting a bit of a vantage point. It's still light, everybody. It's still very good um, sort of normal light for us. So these lions are not really on the enthusiastic hunt just yet. I think they'll wait for it to get a bit darker. They do. Mara Triangle. We've seen it three times already. And just listen. You can hear crickets. Lots of insects coming out as a result of the rain we've had here. Frogs calling. In the same way that you've had all of those new, all of that new life coming out of the ground after the rains of Juma. Everyone, this is just 
too wonderful. Andre, are you able to push the levels a bit on my microphone? I think I may have covered it with too much sponge. All right, everyone, what we're going to do, we're going to just take, what I want you to do is take a deep breath in. And you can smell a bit of rain in the air. You can smell a bit of straw. You can smell green grass. But mostly you can just smell Africa. And that's what we want you to experience. As the sun sets, the rain falls in the, in the Serengeti in the southern parts of the Mara. And the lions think about going on the hunt. Right, we've watched the sunset in East Africa. Let's head down to South Africa to watch the sunset there. Right, everybody, we're on the hunt. There they are in infrared, walking down the road towards where that one lioness went. Not sure where she is now, and we'll just give you sight quickly while they're static like this of the infra, at least the thermal imaging camera. Now that is the thermal imaging field. Well, that's me, obviously, over there. And there's the thermal imaging camera. Isn't that beautiful? As the lions go to sleep. So there's one heading off towards the left. And in the background there, that is not the lights of a town twinkling. That is, in fact, a herd of herbivores. And we're pretty sure that that is the direction in which these cats are heading. Don't know where the sixth one is yet. We had five recently. Anyone know where the fifth one is? There we are scanning, you can see. The fifth lioness, that could be a fifth lioness. It could also be a topi, a buffalo, a warthog, a human being. Indeed, it could be a taper. <laughs> it could be anything. All right, let's go back to the lions. Hello, everyone. Three of them lying on the road here. They look pretty hungry, so let's see. Hello, Annie. You were wondering about cubs, everyone's favourite. Do we have we seen any? No, Annie, we haven't. The reason we haven't is that the cubs have been killed in this pride. Recently been a pride takeover. So if you have just joined us, three male lions came into this area of the Marsh Male Coalition, and they have taken out seven cubs born to this pride. This young male here, just at the right age to have escaped the attentions of the adult males. That said, we haven't seen him with the adult males, and it is quite possible that he is with the females here, just trying to avoid the rest of, the, of, of those males. Now, they don't look very full to me. They ate yesterday evening, and so I think they're going to hunt tonight. They've certainly got up and moved. They've done a bit of stalking of some Thompson's gazelles a little bit earlier. We thought there might be something up here that they were coming to stalk. This is what lions do. They'll move a bit, snooze a bit, move a bit, snooze a bit. And as long as they're not sort of flat asleep like they can be, well, then we're possibly in for a, a good night's hunting. And if you're just wondering, or if you're wondering how long this is going to go on for, we're going to keep going until these lions either go to sleep or the rain starts to become truly unpleasant and Jandre drowns up top there like he nearly did yesterday or until they kill which is what we did last night and if you missed it last night this is the Kichwa Tembo Pride two young males, four females there is another female away from the Pride at the moment she is uh, sort of acting as consort to the three big adult males that have in this Pride, or not in this Pride they've taken over as the dominant coalition and she much like Amber Eyes did um, down at Juma when the Birminghams took over, she is trying to appease them. There's the other lioness there, way in the distance of Jandre's infrared beam. And they're up. Here we go. They're having a bit of a play there. Look at that. Martin, you say, isn't it a bit dangerous to drive around lions in a roofless car? Well, I mean, some of these lions have given us a bit of a, a look, especially at night. But Martin, no, I don't think it's dangerous. I'll tell you why, is that they just don't see us. 
in the same way that they would if we were on foot. You know, we've driven around Juma, and people are driving all over the Sabi sand as we speak into the night, following lions and leopards and the other predators of the area. And there's no roof at all on those cars. There's no even side to the cars. So, no. Once the lions become habituated to the vehicles, there is uh, very little danger. You'd never want to take things for granted. And certainly we had a lion come very close to us now. And what happened was... Mm, what's off to the left there, Graham? Is there another lion? To, to, to the left? Yeah, but what's the male looking at there? Is he, what's he looking at to the left? Yes. Well, there we are. There's the sixth one there. Right, we have the whole pride now. She's just calling. Look, 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 the male's going. <laughs> How cool is that? <laughs> that is so cool. So that's thermal imaging, telling the difference between the temperature of the ground and interpreting that, of course, as lions, which those are. Great, we've got all six together. Wonderful stuff. Let's go back to infrared. And just to give you an idea of the car we're in now, it's a it's a bigger Land Rover than Wendy, Rusty or Jigger. It's a longer one, which means it's got three rows of seats in it and three little roof gaps, but the windows and the doors are still firmly in, in place. Oh, look, I think they're going to have a little bit of a play there. There we are. <laughs> Is that a lioness on the right and a young male on the left? And you can see he's still very playful. And this is what exactly what happened last night. They started to move a bit. They did a bit of territorial marking. That's what's going on there. They did a bit of playing. And then they got on with the serious business of hunting. And if you weren't watching last night, the first thing they did was to be followed by three hyenas, which quickly became four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And eventually, they stumbled across the hyena den. And they were pinned down for a couple of minutes. And the young male went off. He seemed to draw away the hyenas a bit. Things calmed down. There was a Mexican standoff, if you like. And then um, they headed off into the night as the rain began to pour. There they all are. I'm going to sneak slightly forward while Jandre shows you that picture. Now, the reason it looks like that, everyone, is Jandre is actually showing the monitor through the screen. So he's f sorry through the lens. So he's filming <laughs> the infra the thermal imaging monitor. It's a very well relatively new technology. There is my hand <laughs> pointing at the lions. <laughs> so they don't seem to be particularly enthusiastically on the hunt just yet. But I suspect that will change. I think if they weren't going to hunt at all, they wouldn't have moved when the sun went down. It's now totally pitch black. Without the aid of the infrared lights, wouldn't be able to see at all. I have a very dim light on in the front of the car so that I don't drive into a giant artfark hole. Or perhaps into a hyena den. Just stop over here. All right, Jandri. One, two, three, four, five, six. Good. Hold pride. And that young female who's been playing consort to the three males, she actually killed today, just before we could get to her. She killed a little baby zebra. So these lions, they are exceptional at killing. But they may do quite a lot of sleeping this evening as well. It's a very comfortable evening. Temperature's good. Gentle breeze. Grass smells the most magnificent smell you've ever smelt in your life. 
Oh, and I didn't tell you all, viewers, please, you can exhale after the last time I said to you, take a deep breath in. I know one of you sent through a comment saying you were going blue. You may now exhale and enjoy the scent of the grasses that the lions are lying on. And hopefully, oh, in the background I can hear the hyena clan starting to give voice to their territory. Oh. Oh. Hello, Yorkie. You're wondering if lions and hyenas will ever share a kill. Yorkie, I've seen it before, actually. I've seen lions and hyenas eating from the same carcass. That's mainly because they are unable to sort of protect the kill from each other because the weight of numbers is such that everything's balanced and at the same time they're unable to move um, they're unable to sort of move the move the kill away so often on a big kill like a buffalo I've seen that happen in the Sabi sand never seen it happen here I suspect it wouldn't happen here because there's so many hyenas and one of the very interesting things about last night's interaction was that despite the fact that these lions were outnumbered, I mean, there were six lions to probably almost 40 hyenas, the hyenas didn't press home that advantage, which I thought was very strange. That's almost a ratio of one lion to seven hyenas. So I'm not sure why they did that. Although, for them to take, or take the risk of physical conflict with a lion right now is simply not worth it. There's so much that's died out here of natural causes. Um, zebra and wildebeest carcasses we see half eaten all the time. <clears throat> Piles of vultures all over the plains eating them. And I think the hyenas looked extremely well fed. I just thought, you know, they thought to themselves, what's the point of a big fight with the lions over a little zebra when there is so much to eat? Well, this is a very, very good question. Shelley, you say, if these are territorial lions, and the hyena den has been there for hundreds of years, how is it the lions stumbled onto it? Well, I mean, the, the thing to say is that the hyena den moves all the time. And we were actually told that the hyena den wasn't where we found it last night, or where we accidentally found it, and so did the lions. It was in another area. That area has obviously just been vacated. They've moved to a new den. The lions have probably moved through there once or twice in the last week, not, and there hasn't been anything there. But those hyenas will move regularly. Now, what's she looking at? It's a very astute question, and thank you for it. As I was wondering it myself, actually, I thought to myself, how on earth did these lions who know this area so well, who interact with those hyenas probably on a nightly basis, how did they manage not to know that it was there? Anyway... I didn't seem to. Now, we're searching with a thermal imaging camera to see what that lioness is looking at. At the moment, there is no white spot, no bogey off the starboard bow. <laughs> to coin a phrase used by Graham Wallington. Well, that lion can see something. Maybe it is a little scrub hair. Ah, Laura, you say there are no biting flies here in the Mara. Their ears don't seem as chewed up as the Juma lions do. I haven't been bitten by a fly yet, have you, Jandri? Negative. Not even Jandre has been bitten by a fly, and we all know if there's anyone going to attract flies around here, well, uh, that's me being unkind. It's my first insult of the night, everybody. There will be many more to follow. Um, I... D I'm not sure that, well, I certainly haven't seen any. I don't know what, if there are biting flies here or not. I know further south of here that many of the lions actually climb trees, apparently, to get away from the flies. So I don't think there's any... Sorry about that. Gone to sleep. Shortage of flies in the general Mara Serengeti ecosystem. What a tired fellow. But in this area, there don't seem to be too many. I'm also not sure how much of the, the scrappiness of the ears of the lions of Juma are caused entirely by biting flies. I think they fight a lot with each other. They also run through very thorny vegetation. Look at this. This is classic pre-hunt behaviour. Isn't that nice? Soft bed of grass. Enormous clawed foot. 
<laughs> How cool is this? They're just so like domestic dogs and cats in so many ways, aren't they? Young male, restless, irritating everyone else, wanting to play, sitting on his mates, sitting on his aunts and cousins and his mother, and then putting up with it, but eventually getting a little irritated. Alright, we're going to stay here. I think darkness has probably fallen in South Africa now, so let's head back to, well, what Taylor has turned into our prime sort of inv nocturnal invertebrate finder, and she's not about to dis disappoint you now. Back you come to the Mara, everybody. The wind is starting to pump a little bit. The lion's heads are up, and I think they're thinking about food, but they may well just be thinking about having another snooze. Yes, indeed, that is in fact what they're doing. Well, there we go. One male up. No, female, sorry. <laughs> One female up. And you can see there quite clearly, oh, that she's tired. What I was going to say you can see quite clearly is the fact that she's got swollen teats, and that's because I think she was probably one of the lionesses who had cubs. One of them, of course, will also be the mother of these two males. I think they're probably brothers. Graham, does anything slow up, show up on the thermal imager from around the clearing, or just the lion's? At the moment, Graham is scanning the clearing on the thermal imaging camera, and there is something very far away. It could be... <laughs> it could be anything, really. But it also could be lights on the horizon of Serena. That Serena is the headquarters of the Mara Triangle. Oh, here we go. Something's arrested their attention. Now, this is what lions do, everybody. Please be patient about this. This is what they very often do. They move a bit, they sleep. They move a bit, they sleep. And then suddenly, if something either takes their enthusiasm, they spot something, they smell something, they go in on the hunt. They're not desperately hungry, but they're also not full. And I think they will hunt at some time, or at some stage today. And we've now thrown our lot in with this lot. So we're going to spend the rest of the evening with them. Now, the, just to keep you posted and perhaps give you a bit of a recap, the broadcast is uh, scheduled to go until 10.30 Central African time, 11.30 local time here. We'll see what happens. Yesterday we ended early because the lions killed and we knew that we wouldn't get any better than that. Uh, tonight, maybe they'll be hunting after 11.30, in which case we'll probably be following them then. So it's all rather... Um, well, not vague, it's very fluid. We're going to decide on what to do about what happens here, dependent on what these lions are doing. And maybe the Inkahumas, or maybe a leopard, a Juma, will be hunting too. Oh, here we go. Heads up. They've heard or smelt something. We're looking with the thermal camera. Can't see anything there. As soon as we do, we'll show you the thermal imaging image. Hello, Warrior Cats Forever. With a Twitter handle like that, I'd expect you to know the answer to every single cat question there was. You say, why do lions hunt at night? Warrior Cat, unlike the pride from which you obviously come, because you clearly hunt during the day. Uh, you say, why do they hunt at night? Warrior cat, it's because they can see well during the night. They see much better than the other animals. They're big cats, which means that they need the cover of darkness often to succeed at hunting, especially on these open grass plains. Now, what you find often with a cat like a leopard, while they absolutely do hunt at night, because they're smaller, they operate on their own, they move in and amongst the trees, and they will often hunt during the middle of the day. These lions do sometimes, and certainly the lioness I spoke of earlier, she killed when there was still lots of light left. But a big pride like this hunting on their own,
they're going to need the cover of darkness to move across these plains. And they've got better eyes than any other animal out here, bars perhaps the hyenas, and so they can see, probably as well as we can see with this infrared, they can see into the night. Now, I, I cannot see where those lions are. They're sitting probably, oh, I don't know, about 20 meters from me perhaps, um, and I cannot see them. I'm looking out into the darkness right now as we speak, and I cannot see them at all. So they are being lit entirely with infrared, which clearly is making them very sleepy. Jandre, why is the infrared making them sleepy? It is a rather soporific evening, I must tell you. But it is gorgeous. Insects calling the odd frog. Wind blowing. Rain falling to the south, hopefully not on us. And the lions, with any luck, at some stage during the next 12 hours or so, will get up and do some hunting. Hello, Tasha Michelle. You want to know if I feel uneasy sitting with these lions for the first time in the darkness? Tasha Michelle, I don't. I'm sitting next to the driver's seat. My door is closed. I'm very safe here. Jandre, however, is sitting perched, riding on the crow's nest there. Um, Jandre, do you feel threatened at all? Negative. He says he doesn't feel threatened. That's because he's very brave. Tasha Michelle, without being facetious, no, I don't. Look, there have been one or two times when the lions have looked at us because they're not quite used to the big camera sticking out the front of the or top of the roof, but really it's been a kind of, ooh, what's that? And then they calm down and they're fine. Exactly the same as the lions of Juma. And you know that Jamie sat with the lions for a long time yesterday evening at Juma, and they that car is completely uncovered. The camera sits even further a, sort of away from the top of the car, and the cameraman much more exposed than here. The lions don't even react. So while absolutely we take care, and absolutely we are very careful to watch their behavior and watch how they operate, we are very, very um, confident at this stage that they are not going to react to us at all. And we watched them on the hunt yesterday, and they were absolutely fine. Hello, Susan R. You're wondering if these lions are a different subspecies to the ones that we get in South Africa. The answer, Susan, is probably a debatable no. Uh, many would say that they are, and they're the East African subspecies of lions, and some would say not. Some would say that they're exactly the same subspecies and that there's no difference at all. Um, I think you'll probably find this period that they've been separated from the southern African population probably means that there is almost sufficient genetic diversity for them to be considered a different subspecies. But you know, lions used to contiguously raid from the Cape of South Africa all the way up East Africa into much of West Africa. They skipped the Congo Basin and the Sahara. Then they went into Europe, you know, and at one stage were the world's most widely spaced or widely distributed cat. And then as probably largely due to human beings, things have changed and they're... Um, <laughs> I'm just listening to Rebecca there. And what you'll find is that their distribution has been separated by human beings. And because of that, the genetic diversity has probably sort of split. They probably are slightly different genetically now. Right, Jamie Patterson, this is what Rebecca told me, has got creepy crawlies of the night. So let's go across and say hello to them. We are back, everybody, and the lions are up. Well, they're not doing what anyone would describe as hunting. They've been playing a bit and biting each other and knocking about. What is that? That's a light up ahead, is it? I think that's the light of the gate. But now they're still starting to get restless, and they haven't been sleeping very soundly. They've been rolling around and wagging their tails and picking their nails, picking each other's noses, you've just seen there. And now they seem to be on the move. This is good news. <laughs> John, where are they? Um, they are 10 30. 10 30, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Here we go, everyone. Now, there's a big thicket to the left of where we're sitting now. So hopefully, we'll be able to keep up with them. I'm pretty sure we will. Uh, yeah, I think just stay on that one for now. Is that one at 11 o'clock? Yes. You go a little bit further, faster. You don't want to drive into a large hole. Now these lions tend to war... Oh, they're playing with each other there. <laughs> How cool is that? This is brilliant. Here we go. This is fantastic. <laughs> this is why we're here, everyone. Pride moving in the night and no boundaries between us and the Pride Territory so we can follow them wherever they go, provided I can get us there in the car. This is pretty much what happened yesterday and we're going to learn about this Pride as we follow them. We've got another two nights after this. So tonight and for two nights after this we'll be figuring out how they move, which way they move, whether they hunt every night, whether they hunt every few nights. But this now is hunting behavior. And obviously going to the loo. But everyone's got to do that all the time. Hello, Sean in Ireland. You want to know if the males hunt with the pride? It looks like a nasty gully going on here. It is a little distressing. Sean, the males do sometimes hunt with the pride, not very often. It's mainly because, of course, they are scavengers largely rather than hunters, but they do hunt from time to time, especially the bigger prey. I'm going to have to put on some white light, otherwise we're going to probably have an accident. Oh my goodness. Oh, there's one on the tree there, Jandre. Oh, two playing next to us, the other side. One going into the tree. Let's go look at the one in the tree. <laughs> She's going up into the tree. How cool is that? Take some screenshots, everybody, and just remember, we are totally live. Hashtag Safari Live, questions at wildearth.tv. Send us your questions, send us your comments. You're currently watching a lioness perched in a tree in the middle of the Mara Triangle, slapping another one as she tries to climb up. They're sharpening their claws, hopefully in preparation for a hunt. Way in the distance, I can hear other lions calling. Look at that very elegant dismount. They're feeling very frivolous, these lions, but there's a nasty gully here that I'm not sure that I can get through. Oh, goodness. Let me quickly load the map. See where we are. This isn't the Mara River, but it's almost certainly a tributary thereof. Ooh, oh, I don't know what we're going to do now. I think we may be able to... Is, that, is it a gully or is it a hole? Just shine off to the right with some white light if you don't mind. Looks like a big ditch, but whether it's a, a hole that stops here... Yeah, I'm not going to try and cross that, everybody. But let's see if they don't pop out this side. Can you see anything inside this gully? No, I know I can't get through here. Don't worry, Graham. I'm not going to <laughs> attempt it. I just want to know, if you shine down to the right, are the lions still in there? Yes, they are. They're drinking there. Let's see if they come out again. I will try and move a little closer there, Jandri. <laughs> OK. 
Okay, they've not crossed. Now, we don't know where this gully goes. We do know that there's a road that crosses it a long way the other side. We're going to have to make a call in about a minute as to whether we race around to the other side or wait and see if they don't come back to this side. But as you can see, trying to get a car through there would be, well, trying. They're moving the other side. Let's make a call, guys. We're going to go round. I'm going to go right, because I know there's a road that goes around that side. Joseph, what do you think? Joseph is our Ascari today, everybody. Does the road go around this gully? Well, down, down there. Down there. Yeah. Yes. All right, everybody, while we try to decide what to do here, I think they're going to go around the other side of this gully. I'm not sure. While we decide, let's head across to Jamie. She's got another nasty arachnid to show you. Me? No, we're not. We're heading north. Now we've got some space. We're okay for now. Where? Hello everybody, sorry we've lost comms with the final control, um, which means that they are now speaking via Mrs. Wallington in the back of the car uh, on some other kind of device, not sure what. We're following the lions now north, we got round that gully and we're heading through the plains with them. They're going towards a sort of woodland area, don't seem to be spotting anything great. We've had to unfortunately turn the thermal imaging camera off and that is because we had three drops of rain and it's not so good in the rain I'm afraid. Anyway, it may dry up as the night progresses. Let's see what happens. But they're on the hunt for sure. We're just going to stick with this one for now. The others are, I think, to the left of us. But we'll just stick with the one in front of us for now. See what she does. It would be very helpful, of course, to have the thermal camera to see what they were stalking or if they're stalking. They're still horsing about, though, you know. They still keep chasing each other and having a good play. Oops, big bump. Hold on, everyone. Just a glorious evening. I'm not sure if there are any questions coming through. You, sand, you can still send them. They will be typed out to Mrs. Wallington, who will then head them to me, and I shall answer questions. Hashtag Safari Live questions at wildearth.tv. <coughs> We're heading north through the Mara Triangle. If you have just joined us, this is the Kichotembo Pride. Four females, two, li uh, two young males, and they're on the hunt. Yesterday they killed a female a little baby zebra off with, under the attentions of at least 40 hyenas. That was tremendously exciting stuff. We'll see what happens now. They, didn't, they don't look very full. You can see there she turns. Very good condition but not exactly stuffed full, and I know many of you would have watched the Inkahuma Pride uh, sitting on a buffalo kill, and you know how massive belly they get. Well, the first lions two nights ago that we saw, they did the same sort of thing. They had enormously fat bellies, didn't seem to be vaguely interested in any kind of eating. These chaps, not quite the same. They're on the prowl. Now, let's see. Can't see anything at the moment for what they might be hunting, but that's of course because it's totally pitch black. We're hunting with the lions in the darkness. They're being illuminated by infrared light. Jandre is operating the camera in infrared mode. Let's just stop and let her have a bit of a listen. And a smell, of course. You can see the wind has died down now.
apparently my phone is ringing for Skype. I'm not sure about that. Here we go. Try and re-establish contact with the final control. No, I'm, uh, Emma, I'm not... Oh, here we go. We're back with the final control, everybody. Joy and rapture unforeseen. Jandre, please mute yourself. Otherwise, all we can hear is Jandre's rain jacket. Today, he brought a rain jacket, everyone. It was a very clever idea of his, because yesterday he got very, very wet indeed. And he had winkled fingers at the end of the drive. He had to have a very hot shower to make sure that he was warm again. Not so, Jandre. Quite so. Quite so, he says. He's been quite vociferous today. He said three words while filming. Three words too many, but he has said three words. <clears throat> Right, Mr. Wallington has decided the deluge that th is threatening is no longer threatening, and he's bringing out the thermal camera to see if we can spot what these lions have been looking for. Jason, a very good point you make there. You say, is Graham happy not carrying an umbrella this evening? I think he's relatively happy. Um, I think last night was quite uncomfortable. And look at the thermal image, everybody. Look at this. They're on the stalk. Look at this. Now, those to me look like hyena. What do you think, Graham? Do you think they're topi? Graham thinks that they're topi. Not the flies. We, he, Graham knows those are flies. Um, we think that those animals there might be topi. They do have a similar sort of um, shape, I suppose, to hyenas. <laughs> There's the other lion. So we've got all six now coming towards us here. Haley. You want to know if I'm getting covered by bugs in the same way that the girls at Jumar are? The answer, Haley, is no, I'm not. Um, there is a bug or two on the screen, um, but Jandre is up where most of the bugs are, and they quite like his dreadlocks, so that's basically where they're spending most of their evening now. There's quite a lot to eat in those dreadlocks, so that's what they're doing at the moment. It's quite nice having Jandre around. You see, what he does is he, he, um, he distracts the bugs from, from me. Now the thermal imaging camera, I'm just going to tell you, is showing up quite a large number of what I think, well, they're either, t they're either topa, topi or Hela. Oh, quickly, we've got to go across to Taylor. She's got something interesting in the background there. That's a topi. Well, it's one, two, three, four, five topis. And in the foreground, two lions, one of whom we thought was going to start doing something useful this evening other than lying down and lazing about, but it turns out, no, that isn't the case. They're having a bit of a play, rebonding, just discussing strategy, perhaps, for the oncoming hunt. You're back in the Mara Triangle, everybody. That's why they're topi here. My name is James Hendry on camera today. is Jandre. Jandre will not show you his grubby thumb at the moment because, of course, we are filming the infra, not the infrared, the uh, thermal imaging camera. And Jandre's thumb is so grubby that the thermal imaging camera is unable to register it. Not so, Jandre. <laughs> anyway, we don't know what is going on here, frankly. That wind... Let me just lick my finger and put it out the roof. The wind, to my mind, is uh, not too bad for the lions. That seems to be coming very gently from the topi. And, um... Onto, onto the lions, which means that the topi won't be able to smell the lions, and the lions can smell the topi. And that's the situation you want if you want lions hunting. And just remember, we are completely live. You can ask us questions or comments. Hashtag sorry, live questions at wilder.tv. Now, Rita, you want to know if the topi is 
related to the hartebeest that we find in South Africa. They are they're part of the same family, Rita. The hartebeest and the sesebe and the wildebeest are in the same family. So they're all in the same family. And we get hartebeest up here, and they're called Kirk's hartebeest. A slightly different subspecies from the ones in South Africa. Yeah, the eyes have pricked up a little bit. They are gathering. This is interesting. The topi seem to be not mindful of the fact that there are lions around. Anyway, we'll see what happens here. Then they, I mean, the topi, of course, are in fact very much like the sesebe, a different subspecies of the sesebe. And there they are in glorious thermal green. <laughs> so it's more than just the fire. There are a whole lot more to the right-hand side. I'm not sure what these lions are waiting for, and I'd love you to, I mean, if you have any theories, it'd be good to know what you think they're waiting for. Now, a quick recap while we wait to see what on earth they're going to do. We are live, obviously, in the Mara Triangle. Um, I would normally be addressing you by looking down the barrel of the lens and standing with the light on my face, but because these lines are now quite close to the topi, we are in complete black darkness. Cannot see anything around us but for the infrared light on those lines. So, if we were to switch off the infrared, or if we were to switch the camera to its normal mode, you'd see nothing. I cannot see a thing outside the window of the car. And we're hunting with infrared, we're hunting with a thermal imaging camera, well, the latter of which seems to be faced at me right now. Uh, Andre, that's quite an interesting image, actually. Uh, there I am, everybody. Hello. See, my face is warm. I am not a zombie or a vampire. That is a relief. I thought I might be at one stage, but clearly I am um, as extant as you and I. Right, let's go back. <laughs> Very nice. Thank you, Graham, for that. I am uh, becoming arty, of course. And the lion's just not particularly enthusiastically about to head off after the topi. There's a bit of wind. Now, you see, the wind is not actually great for them. It seems to be blowing the grass slightly towards the topi, and maybe that's why they're being a bit reticent. It's been swirling around here, blowing in different directions all afternoon, and that's because there's been a big storm down south of us. We thought it was going to pour with rain, and thankfully it hasn't done that. And this lion is deeply fatigued by life. She's in very good nick, you know. Very unscraped on the face, and that's quite interesting. Sorrel, you want to know if lions ever get bored? I think that is a wonderful, wonderful question. Just before I answer it, though, I want you to look at that lioness's face. And see if you can... I'm going to ask you a question, everybody. I'm going to see if you can tell a difference between this lioness's face and the Inkahuma lioness's faces. You tell me if you can see any obvious difference there. Sorrel, do lions ever get bored? Um, uh, yeah, I suppose they do, you know. I think the youngsters probably do. They like to play, and therefore I think boredom is probably a response to a need to play, to keep active. So, it's, you know, there will be a, a function behind boredom. And I suspect boredom is the way, what's the body's way of saying, get up and do something. Let's keep the mind active, let's keep the body active, because that's what's going to keep us healthy. So I suspect, yes, the youngsters especially get bored. You wouldn't think that a lioness or a big male lion got bored from the amount of sleeping they do. Perhaps they do now and again. But um, no, I don't think lions get too bored once they're adults. But youngsters, yes. The animals that I think get the most bored are elephants. I think their brains are large. And I think that they think a lot, and I think that they do a huge amount of feeding all day long, especially in a drought. Eee, what's going on here? Especially in a drought, and I've noted lots of times at Juma how the youngsters especially come up, and they spend some time around the vehicle, and I think it's purely for entertainment purposes. Let's have another look at the flare camera now, the thermal imaging. And then Topi seems to be walking slightly closer, maybe. And the lions can see them. I, I mean, it is astounding. You can't believe this. jean I don't suppose it would be possible for you to turn the camera off infrared very briefly, would it? Um, facing the floor? 
no, facing out into the darkness, because I think it's difficult for people to appreciate that it is pitch black out here. Okay, the there we are. So we're going to switch from infrared. Watch this, everyone. <laughs> that is the infrared off. So that is the amount of light that there is. Now, in that light that you're looking at now, which is obviously no light at all, those lions can see the topi. Isn't that amazing? Now we switch the infrared back on. That's so cool. That really is amazing. Wouldn't have a hope of seeing until we bumped into them. That really is very cool indeed. Hello, Stefan. You want to know if these lions have better eyesight than leopards do in the dark? I don't know. There's a nice big teeth. I don't know if they do, but I'm going to suggest that they probably do, and that's because I think that they hunt more at night than do the leopards. The leopards do quite a lot of hunting during the day. Right now, let's see what's going to happen here. Ready myself in the cockpit. Now, oh, maybe she's going to go and try and flank them. Rondi, let's just have a quick look at the others to see what they're doing. There we go. They're watching her, but not really. Okay, we can go back to her. I think, yeah, let's watch her on the thermal. Moving towards the topi. If they're topi, I mean, we think they are. Now, we need to think about what to do. If she moves too much further forward, I'm going to follow her a little bit. Okay, I think we should just get a little bit behind her. Can you still see her, Jean Yeah, Okay. We're just going to follow her slowly. I've got no lights on now at all. Okay, I will tell you. Thank you, Jean -Dre. No, that's too bright. There we go. There's a nice gentle light. We've got a little bit of light in front of us. I can see her turning. Thank you. Now let's see what's going to happen here. We've got to keep our distance. The other lions don't seem to be mobile yet. The best way for us to spot them is now going to be with a thermal camera because they're out of infrared range. Couple of holes here, everybody. Sorry, mind the seasickness. She's at 10. I'm just watching a hole. 930. You can see her. Got her there. Thank you. The, ni the numbers I'm saying, everyone, is Jean -Dre just saying she's at 930. She's at 10. She's at 11. There. What's that in front of her there? Look at that. What do you got there? What do you reckon, Graham? It's Topi. It's definitely Topi. They haven't seen her. She's moving now. No, they may have seen her. Here come the rest of the lions. Any idea where they are, Graham? They're running. Graham, where are they? Left or right? Oh, okay. Topi running. Yeah, we're just going to quickly try and find the lion. She's in front of us. She's chasing the topi, everybody. We need to just be a little bit careful about driving here. She's stalking. She seems to be chasing. I think that's her in the second from the right. There she is. Okay, we need to try and get the infrared on them now, I'm afraid. Any idea how close? There their eyes are. I'm going to go a bit closer. This is fantastic. This is so amazing. You still see the lion, Graham? No, there she is. We've got the lion there in front of us now. So she gave up there. The rest of her clan, absolutely unhelpful. I wonder if this is the same lioness, perhaps, that chased the 
Thompson's gazelle earlier on. So you can see there, she was completely out of our range, quite a distance from us, probably about 150 meters or so, 450 to 500 feet. She's going back to the others. That's the lights of Angama Mara you can see in the distance. That's where we stay. Fantastic that was. I mean, look, it didn't result in a result, but it was very fantastic nevertheless. Heidi, you want to know this lioness seems to have hiccups. How well a topi can see at night? Well, I think clearly very well indeed. There's no ways they saw the lion because of us. She's got hiccups, or she's about to be sick, or a hairball, perhaps. And just in the background, I can hear the topi going... <sniffs> she's got bad allergies. She's obviously hungrier than the others. eating a bit of grass. So hungry. So only one of them earlier on, I don't know if you've just joined us everyone, but earlier on one of the lionesses went after Thompson's gazelle all on her own. The others showed absolutely no interest. Much the same as what's happening here. Let's just listen and Graham, can we do a little scan perhaps? Just to see if there isn't anything else in the offing. There's the other lions. We'll just have a quick look at the fleur there. There are the rest of the lions. And that's at 9.30 from where we are now. There she is. And nothing else really in terms of herbivore around where we are now. Let's see if she spotted something else. Now, as I was saying to you earlier, that young lioness that we've been paying attention to killed a young wildebeest in broad daylight, killed a young zebra in broad daylight today, and so the fact that she is hunting on her own does not in any way mean that she doesn't have a chance of catching something. She might well catch something on her own. The rest will then definitely try and share it with her, but she could easily catch something on her own. Stuart, you, you're wondering if the fact that she's hunting is because she's the only hungry lioness? Stuart, I'm not sure if she's the only hungry lioness. I don't think any of them are particularly ravenous. You know, they don't look skinny and emaci emaciated. But she may be hungrier than the others, yes. All the others are just lazier than she is, and she's, um, she's a productive lioness. At one o'clock. Just going through a little bit of a thicket there. Have to go around that. She's not on the hunt. I'll just put a little bit of light on so I can see what's going on. I think this is the lioness we want to be following, everyone. I don't think the others are going to be doing a great deal. She seems to be substantially more enthused about things than the rest. So let's follow her. I'm just going a little bit too far past her. <laughs> Let's turn off, let her listen. Can't see anything in the thermal camera. We'll just keep watching her. 
Thermal cameras picking up warm hot spots of earth, probably termite mounds, beyond her. But not much in the way of herbivorous antelope and wildebeest, of which there are hundreds of thousands around here at the moment. But who knows, a warthog might pop its head out of one of these termite mounds, and then the game will be on. She's turned around there, she, just because of the slight movement in the vehicle, she's so aware, smelling and listening and looking into the blackness of this night. It's moonless, it's starless, there is no light around at all. Somehow she is able to see. And also sleep. I imagine the rest of the pride will come up here eventually, but I think she's the one to be watching right now. You can't see the rest of the pride in the thermal camera, they are doing nothing. Okay, we're going to sit here with these kitties. Obviously, we're not going anywhere from here. There she is in her thermal imaging glory. Let's head across to Jamie, get an update from her. And if these lions do anything, we'll tell you about it immediately. Well, we're here, everybody. The lions have gone back to sleep. They've done a bit of thinking, but we have got something... Well, we were going to show you something quite special, but unfortunately, the... Well, there it is. Let's have a look at that. Everybody, while we wait for the lions to do something... Please say hello to Graham Wallington. That's him there. Um, he, you can see, has got a very hot mouth, and um, well, that's very telling, isn't it? Really, um, that's his mouth there. Of course, uh, the reason that it is not hot around it is that he's sporting a beard. Very nice. That's nice. And show us what you were doing just before we came live, Graham. There we are. He's just tickling his brain. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. Welcome to Safari Live, everybody. This is the Mara Triangle. <laughs> and that is Graham Wallington scratching his ear. Ah, now, thank you, viewers. You've replied. Ah, oh, that's interesting. You reckon that the nose looks longer to compared to the lions of Juma? I would say maybe marginally longer. But the thing that I noticed about that lioness's face, many of you have picked up, is that it has fewer scars on it. And that's exactly what I was thinking about. These lionesses didn't fight at all over that zebra kill yesterday. They did a little bit of growling and squabbling, but very little in the way of fighting. And the Inkahumas seem to fight quite a lot. All South African lions that I've seen uh, fight over their food extensively, and I think that's why they get such scars all over their faces. The males here definitely have got scars, and you can see, I mean, old scar face that we saw today. Well, he has missing his right eye and the right eyelid, and that, I'm almost certain, was the result of a fight with another lion. Hello, James Richard, and you're answer, asking, is their appearance um, solely different because of their environmental conditions or the conditions that they are, are living in? Well, yeah, I would say so. Look, um, I, like I said, there is probably some kind of small genetic distinction between these lions and the Southern African version, but they are in no way able or unable to interbreed with each other. They, I think some might describe them as a subspecies, but many would probably just decide them as the same species and have gene, been genetically separated for some time. Many would also describe them as deeply lazy at this stage of the game, given that some of them clearly are hungry, but sleep has overwhelmed them. And this is what lions do, you see. And sometimes you've got to be real patient when you're looking at them. I must just tell you, I'm quite pleased they're going the direction they are now. They've kind of turned around a bit. So we weren't too far from the northern boundary of the Masai, of the Mara Triangle. And there are no fences at all. And they go on to conservancy land there, much the same as the Sabi Sand and Timbavati are sort of private areas attached to the National Park. So the same thing occurs here. Anyway, 
very nice that in this vast expanse of 510 uh, square kilometers or 51,000 hectares that we've been able to watch these lions in or well, very nice of them not to cross out of that massive piece of land the lions they're virtually indistinguishable from the grass that of course makes them very successful hunters in this area not right now they're being very successful sleepers And hopefully something will come grazing across the lawns at some stage. We are constantly scanning uh, for the signs of herbivores with the thermal imaging camera. And should any show their heads, well, we'll be very sure to tell you about it. But I think it is going to be worth sitting with these lions. It might take quite a long time before they actually do any hunting. But let's sit with them and see. So let's have a quick recap. If you have just joined us, we are on basically a seven and a half hour game drive at the moment. We'll come to a close, depending on what these lions do, at about 11.30 this evening. Uh, that's East African time. That's 10.30 Central African time. And that's the time when the Sabi Sands has to actually close down. So Jamie and Taylor will go back in at that stage. We'll make a call on these lions around about then if they seem to be completely fast asleep and um, every, all the viewers are completely fast asleep too, then we may well call it quits. But I suspect these things are going to go hunting, so I suggest you stay with us and let's see what happens. If you're cooking your dinner or perhaps thinking... Whoop. She heard the word dinner. You see that, John, right? If you're cooking your dinner or you are, uh, I don't know, doing the washing and the ironing, perhaps you're trying to find mismatched socks somewhere in your sock drawer. Keep this on in the background because there's going to be some action at some stage tonight, I'm sure. Hello, Julia. You're wondering why I'm talking so loudly. Julia, I'm virtually talking at a whisper. This is me whispering, Julia. And you can hear it's almost the same volume as when I speak like this. Uh, the reason it's loud is because the microphone that I have attached to my head, yes, that is correct, attached to my head, is uh, very efficient at picking up the sound. And we are very careful not to disturb these animals with sound, Julia. Um, we absolutely do our very best to be completely observers here, not participants at all. And you can see that these lions are not in the slightest bit disturbed by the sound of my voice. Indeed, it would seem to be anaesthetizing them entirely. They have been anaesthetized, Jandre, you see that? By the sound of my voice. Jandre also has been anaesthetized by the sound of my voice. He is no longer speaking at all. You still there, Jandre? Ah, I can hear him snoring behind us. He too is a little sleepy. <laughs> I, will, I will tell you that we've had a very pleasant packed lunch out here um, and rather than my telling you about our packed lunch let's, let's tell you about the hyenas Deborah you want to know where they are uh, unfortunately they're a long way south of where we are now I can hear them going see that was very clever of me although it's slightly nasty um, the lions think there's a hyena sitting in this car next to them well they're a little bit suspicious of it but I don't think they're genuinely suspicious anyway we can hear that noise way down to the south of where these chaps are so I don't think they are following the lions and I wonder if the lions didn't decide to head off in this direction oh high action here everybody another lion has arrived and is now sitting down. One of the things we did see, by the way, while you were away, is that one of these young males almost tried a sort of half-hearted mount of one of the females, and that means that they must be about to hit puberty, and that means that their days are numbered, their days of being around this territory with the three new males are now deeply numbered. A couple of crickets calling in the background. <laughs> yeah. 
couple of tails flicking. Andre, I'm going to stand up. Hold on. Yes, put a little bit of white light on. Let's see what's going on. I'll be able to say hello to everybody. For I'm sure, although they're definitely not missing the sight of my face, I'm missing the sight of theirs. Let's say hello. Hi. So here we are on the Mars IMR, everybody. It's night time. Can't see anything around me. Can just see Jean-Dre's hat over the top of his lens where he's looking. I'll show you where we're staying. Not there. That's where the lions are staying. We're staying up there. Come on, Jean-Dre. And what we're looking at there is the lights of Angama Mara. Now I've got to tell you, the place that we're staying in, we've really lucked out at, it is the most gorgeous lodge. All we can see is a little bit of light there, I'm afraid. Um, not the, possibly the best view of the lodge, um, but it is a spectacular place indeed, and we're most privileged to be staying there. There in the background you can hear the hyenas. Otherwise, everything is very deeply peaceful out here. Just listening now. Some hippos grunting. Many crickets. A couple of frogs. Hippos again. But other things, everything. It's a very quiet night indeed, and I wonder, you know, last night these lions were very enthusiastically on the hunt from the word go. I wonder if that wind and rain which allowed them to be almost invisible to the other animals around the place, I wonder if that didn't allow them or inspire them slightly more than the current conditions. Perfectly still now, no rain at all, one or two stars in the sky, but nothing to sort of write home about. This is what it is, hunting lions at night, you see. We've got to be a bit patient sometimes. Mm, their heads are up. And the thermal imaging camera seems to be on strike. I think that's because the operator is on strike. I don't suppose we could have a scan, could we? Yes, of here we go, sorry, here we go. One doesn't want to tell one's boss what to do, of course. But sometimes one must. Oh dear. Graham's just thrown his supper onto the floor, either in a temper or because he's um, or because he tripped over it. There's not a lot of space in here, of course. I've not turned on the windscreen wipers by mistake. And the lions have seen something. And we'll just get the thermal imager up and see what they've seen. Let it be something walking towards them. Mm. No. There is, there is nothing in the clearings. I can hear the lowing of a herd of buffalo. Oh. I'm just listening. This lioness is also listening. Might, might be a distress call of a buffalo. Let's just check. There are one, two, three, four in there. And two there. So they're all here. We're going to keep listening in the distance there. If it does turn out to be a buffalo distress call, we might decide to go over and see what it is. But in the meantime, let's head across to Jamie, get an update from her and find out what's happening down in South Africa. Right, everybody, massive action here. You can see, if you look very carefully on the left-hand side of the screen there, there is a piece of grass waving very slightly in the wind. There it is. Sorry, it's on the right-hand side. Jandre, quickly, before it stops waving. Where? Well, that's it. Well done. Excellent. <laughs> this, I'm afraid, everyone, is how lions hunt sometimes. I'm personally of the opinion that they are going to hunt. 
But uh, when that eventuality takes place, well, I'm just not sure when it's going to be. Now remember, we are live from the Mara Triangle in Kenya. If you're not familiar with Kenya, as I wasn't until fairly recently, well, it's a magnificent country in East Africa and certainly the site of many famous great wildlife films. Many of the scenes that you saw in The Lion King, that biologically heinously inaccurate film, but heartwarming story that we saw both as a cartoon and on stage, well, many of those sorts of scenes are found right here in the Mara Triangle where we find ourselves now. Likewise, the great film Out of Africa with Meryl Streep and Robert Redford in their prime that was shot actually in these very hills, on the, over these very plains. He flew that funny little, sop, it wasn't a sop with camel, was it? Something like that. Anyway, that was the plains that they flew over in that biplane. And he's actually Dennis Fitchhatton, the chap on whom the character was based, uh, is buried not far from where we're staying at Ngama Mara. And that very final scene, I don't know if you've seen Out of Africa, everybody, but if you haven't, I su suggest strongly that you get go and I nearly said get it at the video store, but of course such things don't really exist anymore, do they? Um, <laughs> you can get it on Netflix or something like that. Um, there's a wonderful scene where poor old Dennis, spoiler alert, is put in the ground to go and join the worms, and he was buried very close by to where we actually, Rajandra and I are sharing a room. Um, I, that brings with it, of course, its own problems. But there's a little hillock next to where we live, and that's where this amazing scene of Dennis Fitchhatton's funeral took place, and there was a lion sitting on top of his grave. And it is the most beautiful place. If ever I am put in the ground, I hope that now I shall have a view like that from my final resting place. That lion... Oh, I've stood up, everybody. That's why I'm panting so heavily. That lion is now a sort of looking around the place. Hang on a second, John Ray. I'm in a deeply uncomfortable position. <clears throat> okay. There we are. Now, let me introduce you to the crew over here. The lions, of course, the main characters, doing absolutely nothing at all to entertain us. And so they just left to me and John Ray's very skillful camel work to tell you what's going on. Down in the bowels of the vehicle here, we have Joseph. Joseph, wave at the camera. Joseph is fast asleep currently. Mm -hmm. um, and um, in the back, Mrs. Wallington was fast asleep until fairly recently, too. Uh, she seems to have picked up a small bug on the aeroplane, unfortunately. But I think she's okay now. And Graham, well, we don't know what he's doing, really, but we're not allowed to talk about that. That's the crew that we have out here tonight. John Dre, of course, standing there in his... Uh, Bought a new hat while we were at the airport, everyone. It's, um... Well, it suits him, I suppose. <laughs> Let's have a look at the lions. <laughs> look at that, Andre. I think there's another piece of grass waving on the right-hand side of them. Gorgeous. Gorgeous. Yeah, look, there it is. It moved. Did you see that? It's moving again. I'd love to show you where the other two are, but I'm afraid the thermal imaging camera operator's gone on strike again. He's, we have to have a word with him. His union-mandated hours have completed. Oh, hello Dave from Indiana. Great question from you. You want to know how close to the equator we are. We are just south of the equator, not very far south, probably I think about 400 kilometers or so, which is about 60 times 4, which is 240 miles away to the north of us is the equator. And what that means is that it is pretty consistent, the climate here. It's not always summer, no, but it, they, they do have a coolish season and then a hottish season. But what makes the climate here so amazingly perfect is the altitude. We're currently sitting at about 1,500 meters above sea level, and that in feet is about almost 5,000 feet above sea level. 
then if you go up onto where Ngama Mara is, where we're staying, that's 1,900 feet above sea level. And it's just, the climate is perfect. It's consistent. The coldest temperature it ever gets here, 9 degrees Celsius, which is about 50 Fahrenheit. And the hottest temperature it ever gets to is about 34 or so, which I think is around about, oh, about 90 degrees Fahrenheit. So never particularly unpleasantly cold or hot and so I think that makes it even better than it well I mean I think it makes it even better than I thought it was before and Phoebe you say is it normal for us to have afternoon thunderstorms here throughout the year Phoebe no it's not normal to have them throughout the year we do have um, thunderstorms every so often and every afternoon we've been here why are you putting your finger in my ear uh, my cable's coming out of my head, sorry everyone. Jandre suddenly has a finger in my left ear. It's very disconcerting indeed. Um, Phoebe, um, <laughs> things, I have, things I have to deal with up here. Uh, I'm just going to have to compose myself. Um, Phoebe, this time of the year we're into what we call the short rains, and apparently it's a short period of about four or five weeks. So I've read two weeks, but how anyone can predict rain to that accuracy, I don't know. Say four or five weeks where a bit of rain comes, and it does come in the form of afternoon thunder showers, and by the morning they've sort of cleared away. And then there's the long rainy season, which I think is between kind of February and April. It's about six weeks or so when they have the longer rains here. I'm not sure what the rainfall is here. I think it's probably in the region of 600, no, probably 700 millimeters or so, which is about 24, 25 inches. Um, I've got a question from Ryan in the uh, final control, and he wants to know how the intertropical conversion rate works. I have no idea what on earth he's talking about. He may as well have asked me that question in Hebrew. Um, I'm afraid I am unable to help him with that. I would suggest he uses the extremely good internet connection we have in the final control in the Sabi stands, and perhaps he can look it up there. Thank you for that question, Ryan. Hope to meet you soon. Possibly with my right fist. Let's have another look at the lions. <laughs> This time, I think there's a central piece of grass moving. There it is. Fantastic. Now, everyone, if you're wondering why we aren't driving around looking for things, the reason is simply that we're here to follow these lions on the hunt. Yesterday, they did an incredible job of hunting, and I'm sure at some stage during tonight, um, <laughs> You might find that they get up and go away while we are fast asleep here, um, but I'm, we're going to hope that that doesn't happen. But this is how we're going to follow lions live on the hunt. So keep watching, and while we do that, let's head across to Ryan, uh, not Ryan, and let's head across to Ryan's consort, Taylor. She's in the, the Sabi sand searching for the great creatures of Juma.